Hello, and welcome back to the periphery. It's just Afi again, and I promise this is almost certainly the last week that it's just gonna be me giving this little introduction, but we are again releasing an episode from The Vault. This one with the director of the Knight Institute at Columbia University, Professor Jamil Jaffer, who is an expert on First Amendment issues, especially, and the reason, this, and this is also why we wanted to release this episode this week, with two important cases in front of the Supreme Court that has a lot to do with free speech on platforms like Twitter, and Facebook and all the stuff that's, you know, the public square, if you will, these days, where we all talk, where we all chat. And we thought the episode gave incredible context. It's from, I think, November of 2022, so it's a little bit dated, but it's very timely. It gives incredible context for where we are today and the problems that the Supreme Court is currently grappling with, that, you know, an opinion is forthcoming soon. So the internet could change as we know it, literally, right now. Um, Professor Jaffer argued Clapper versus Emergency internationally for the Supreme Court, which involved a constitutional challenge to a federal statute that gave the National Security Agency broad power to monitor international communications. And I don't have opinions on that, but that's neither here nor there. The important part is that this is a very interesting, fun conversation. And uh, we thought it was the most appropriate time to release it now. So with that said... Thank you for joining the conversation, uh, and don't forget to leave us a like, a review, a comment, an email, and we will see you back with our more common type of content next week if you're, I guess, tired of me, but but come on, come on, no way, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, enjoy the conversation, and here it is. Hello, welcome back to the periphery. Um, today we have an exciting episode where we're going to be talking about content moderation uh, with Professor Jamil Jaffer of the Knight Institute. Um, hello, Jamil. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Um, if you if you want to give our listeners kind of a background of you know who you are, what, what uh, your background, and how you kind of came into these um, First Amendment technology sure. issues. Um, so I direct something called the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. It's uh, a relatively new institute. We were created um, in 2016 to focus on on digital age free speech questions. And um, we have a litigation program, a research program, and a public education program. Um, we're still pretty small. I mean, when when we started, it was just me. <laughs> Now, now we're about 25 people. Um, before I came to Columbia, I was at the ECLU for 14 years and I worked uh, initially on national security cases um, and then later on speech privacy and technology cases. Um, uh, yeah, I had a, you know, a, a great run there. It's a great organization, but then had the opportunity to start something new here at Columbia and uh, was excited to get that opportunity. So, so 2016, a lot happened that year, particularly with regards to, I think, the mainstream consciousness of these online platforms. Can you kind of talk to, talk, you know, how did you get into these tech issues? Um, how did it start coinciding with your work that has, you know, resulted in one of the leading uh, institutes on working on pushing the, pu pushing the policy and regulatory frame, uh, field of this, uh, you know, exciting and kind of <laughs> scary time? Yeah, well, so, so, um... I wasn't always a, a, a tech lawyer. I wasn't always a First Amendment lawyer. Uh, even now, I'm not uh, quite sure whether I can, uh, you know, fairly claim to be either of those things. But uh, you know, when I was at the ACLU, I worked on, among other things, uh, a lot of cases at the intersection of the First and Fourth Amendment. So at the intersection of free speech and privacy. Um, so. Uh, when I joined the ACLU, this was in 2002, the Patriot Act had just been passed and we were trying to figure out what the Patriot Act meant, what kinds of powers it gave to government agencies. Uh, we brought a number of lawsuits challenging government surveillance power that was expanded by the Patriot Act. Um, uh, dozens of lawsuits relating to government transparency around issues uh, at the intersection of free speech and privacy. 
Um, and then, you know, we ended up representing Edward Snowden um, in 2013 when he uh, disclosed what he disclosed to The Guardian and The Washington Post, uh, and then brought a number of other uh, First Amendment and Fourth Amendment lawsuits challenging uh, the surveillance programs that he had uh, brought to public attention. Uh, and I also worked on whistleblower cases, um, uh, a lot of First Amendment challenges to the exclusion of foreign scholars from the United States on political grounds. You know, there, there were uh, a whole long list of foreign scholars who were excluded by the Bush administration because they had criticized American foreign policy. And we challenged those exclusions on First Amendment grounds. Uh, but really, the, the, the work that I did that was closest to the work that we're doing now was work around government surveillance, uh, NSA surveillance, FBI surveillance, um, national security letters issued by the FBI or uh, uh, surveillance of Americans, phone calls or uh, emails by the National Security Agency. That, that was the kind of work I was doing before I came here to the Knight Institute. One of the reasons I came to the Knight Institute is, is that, uh, like many other people, I saw that um, issues involving free speech and new technology were going to be uh, you know, crucially important uh, over the next few years. And in fact, um, the Knight Institute grew out of these conversations that Lee Bollinger, who's the president of Columbia University, and Alberto Ibarguen, who's the president of the Knight Foundation, uh, conversations that they had had over many years about uh, the challenges that new technology uh, uh, present to, um, to the free speech framework that we've inherited. If you think of the really big free speech cases from the, the cases that define the First Amendment or that define free speech to most Americans, those cases were decided 50 years ago. Uh, there are cases like the Pentagon Papers case, which is a 1971 case, right? Uh, or cases like New York Times versus Sullivan, um, uh, which established that um, uh, that that uh, public officials can't sue for defamation without meeting a very high bar. Like, these are the cases that define the First Amendment, and they were decided 50 years ago, long before the internet, long before smartphones, long before social media. And this question of whether that framework still makes sense, given the very different um, technological landscape of today, uh, this question of how those precedents should be applied to the very different contexts we're presented with today, those are really, really important questions, not just for free speech, but for, our, for democracy. And uh, Lee Bollinger and Alberto Ibarguen, who, again, you know, came up with the idea for the Knight Institute, saw that early on and created the Knight Institute for that reason. And that was why I wanted to come here. I just thought that, you know, they're right. These are the, you know, among the most important questions confronting society uh, today. And they're hard, they're genuinely hard questions. Um, even if you think of yourself as, you know, a, a free speech, um, uh, you know, deeply committed to free speech, as I do, uh, even if you think of yourself uh, in that way, it's not obvious what the right answers are to some of these questions. Uh, and that, you know, that's a real challenge and also something, you know, exciting. It's, it's, you know, these are really fascinating questions. And, uh, you know, I was lucky to have the chance to make this switch when I did. Uh, Professor Jaffer, I'm, I'm just wondering now, um, I, I, I want to I really want to talk about your experience in the past with uh, national security issues, but regarding what you, what you just said about um, free speech and, and new technology. Um, uh, I, was, I, I was looking over an op-ed that you wrote in the New York Times um, over a year ago about Facebook's new Supreme Court. And there, I think you mentioned a problem that kind of relates to how our old frameworks are really being challenged, where you asked about, where you, we were, you were discussing how the Supreme Court had been asked to review Facebook's decision to ban Trump or suspend Trump from the platform. Uh, and you said that the fundamental problem uh, is that many of the content moderation decisions the board has been charged with reviewing can't actually be separated from the design decisions that Facebook has placed off limits. And then that the board has effectively been directed to take the architecture of Facebook's platform as a given. And that reminds me about how we have to take into account the way that platforms are designed and the effects of amplification in general in considering the equities around speech. Um, it makes me think about how uh, plaintiffs have tried to sue uh, Facebook or Twitter 
for terrorist messages that resulted in terrorist attacks. Um, and obviously those have dealt with, have met with a lot of issues and these are hard questions, but I'm just wondering now, given those, you know, your, your reflections on this, what steps to reform do you find to be the most promising? What areas perhaps, or conversations uh, do you think are very productive right now in finding new frameworks or certainly at least refer, reforming our old ones? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question, but also a very, you know, very big question. Um, you know, I guess one, one thing I'd ask is like reform, you know, in answer to what problem? Because there, there are, you know, there are a lot of problems we could point to um, in this general area. You know, one might be the concentration of power in the hands of a small number of companies. Another might be uh, the problem of misinformation. Another might be the problem of privacy. And not that these aren't deeply connected. They, you know, they obviously, they obviously are, but um, I don't think that there's a single you know, legislative or regulatory solution to, you know, to all these problems. Uh, and I'm skeptical of many of the regulatory solutions that have been offered thus, thus far, um, in part because I think some of them, some of them are, are kind of cures that are worse than the, worse than the disease. Um, that, you know, that said, I, I do think that there are places where uh, you, know, you didn't ask me specifically about regulatory responses, but let me start with regulatory responses. Uh, there are places where, you know, legislatures could make a, a, a real difference to, um, uh, you know, to the speech environment, a positive difference to the speech environment. One, one would be with stronger privacy protections. I think that, you know, some of the pathologies of public discourse right now result from um, uh, the, the fact that tech companies can collect and do collect so much data uh, about our, um, uh, you know, about our activities online, including activities that implicate the freedoms of speech and association, right? Um, uh, the big technology companies have access to really granular information about um, your expressive and associational activities. And the result is that you know, at some level, they they know who you are, you know, better better than you yourself know, you know, know who you are. And to me, that seems like a really big um, uh, privacy issue, but also uh, a free speech issue because I think that you know the the the, the more that the digital public sphere becomes um, uh, dominated by surveillance, uh, the less comfortable people are going to be uh, engaging in those spaces. Uh, in the way that we need to, need them to engage, um, if our democracy is going to work in the way that we want it to, right? People have to. Uh, people can't be worried that by having a uh, by reading a newspaper article online, they are creating a permanent record uh, of their politics or their perceived politics, and that 25 years from now, somebody is going to um, you know confront them with this. Uh, you know, record of their expressive or associational choices from 25, 25 years back. Um, you know, these, these records are in some sense, you know, they're permanent and the restrictions on their use and dissemination are almost non-existent. Uh, and that to me seems like a really big problem, but stronger privacy protections could address that problem or at least could mitigate that problem, right? We could restrict uh, what kinds of information can be collected. We could restrict uh, what people can do with, with that kind of information. Um, so that seems like a promising road to me. Um, I also think that, you know, some kinds of transparency and due process protections um, might make sense too. So, uh, you know, right now a big problem with uh, public discourse on the platforms is that we don't really understand the forces that are shaping public discourse on the platforms. Like, uh, uh, you know, there's content moderation and then there is less visible algorithmic amplification or deprioritization, right, uh, which is largely invisible to, uh, to the public. Uh, and as a result, we don't fully understand the forces that are shaping or distorting public discourse. Um, and certain kinds of transparency might help us better understand uh, those forces. Um, and so there's a bill in Congress right now, you may well have you know, talked about it with other people on, on, on this podcast, but um, uh, 
introduced by Senators Coons and Portman and Klobuchar that would require the platforms to share certain kinds of data with researchers, uh, would also create a kind of legal safe harbor for journalists and researchers who study the platforms. Uh, those kinds of proposals are appealing to me. Um, so I do think that there are things that regulators and legislatures can do uh, in answer to some of the problems that we're, you know, that we're faced with right now. Um, I'm, I'm less excited about regulatory proposals that involve direct um, uh, intervention in platforms content moderation decisions. I see content moderation decisions as analogous to um, editorial decisions that other kinds of actors make and that are First Amendment, that are protected by the First Amendment for good reason. And uh, I don't like the idea of legislatures dictating to platforms what kind of content they have to prioritize or what kinds of content they have to uh, take down. Uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, it's a terrible thing that platforms sometimes make bad decisions uh, when it comes to content moderation, but it would be even worse if uh, the government got to make those decisions for them. So I'm less excited about those kinds of interventions, but I, you know, there's lots of other stuff that, that, that can be done. Those aren't the only possibilities on the table. And, and regarding that, that last point, and I, I, think, I think we'd largely agree about privacy uh, and transparency, that those uh, are certainly really important and, and promising paths uh, forward. But regarding content moderation, and this connects with what we talked with Professor Keller about, um, how do, what do we do when we kind of, if, if, if we recognize the possibility that these platforms simply don't have the manpower, the resources, even the largest ones or the technical capacity to actually provide some kind of moderation for most of their content that really as much as they try or they'll, uh, they'll find very strong and important cases where speech is very dangerous or violates their policies. If these policies aren't enforced effectively uh, because of technical limitations, uh, how, what should we do about the potential damages? For example, the plaintiffs of the families of terrorist victims and things like that. Um, if, if, if really it seems like there's no rationality or there's no rational policy here uh, being forced on these platform environments. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, there's a whole set of these cases involving speech of um, terrorist organizations or, you know, alleged terrorists on the platforms. Um, and I, I don't feel the same way about all of those cases. Like in some of those cases, um, they're, so as a general matter, I don't like the idea that the government can, by designating somebody or a group to be a terrorist group, uh, Make this make speech with that group off limits, right? And that's the way the the law uh, works right now. The State Department gets to decide which groups are terrorist organizations. It's a you know purely political decision. Um, there are many groups um, uh, that aren't on the list. That if you were just making a kind of objective determination about you know are people using violence against civilians, uh, those groups would be on the list, but they're not. Uh, it's a purely political uh, decision which groups go on that list. And one consequence of going on that list is that uh, the platforms are precluded, or anyone is, everybody's precluded from providing material support to those groups. And um, there is a question about what material support means. Like if you provide somebody with an account, are you providing them with material support? Um, and does it matter whether you're providing the group with the account or you're providing an individual with the account? Um, and then does it matter what they're using the account for? You know, so I think it gets, you know, it gets, um, it gets complicated. Or, you know, if you ads on their, or if you display ads on their content or something like that, like, is that? Yeah, material? yeah, no, it, that, right, right. Yeah, so I think it's, um, you know, it gets complicated quickly, but as a general, as a general rule, I, I don't, we don't allow the executive branch to decide who we get to talk to, right? That's a decision that belongs to us. That's what it means to be a self-governed society. That's what it means to, you know, that's the core meaning of free speech is that, or the first amendment is that you get to decide who you talk to. The government doesn't get to decide. Now, there are circumstances in which, you know, there's a law that prevents somebody from, it prohibits somebody from saying a particular kind of thing, you know, from raising money for terrorist activities, 
right? But usually you have a court involved in that process somewhere, right? The court is deciding this person raised money for uh, criminal activity and this person is therefore subject to the following criminal penalty. Um, but the way the material support laws work in practice is that the government puts groups on the list and by putting the group on the list, um, speech with that group or association with that group becomes at least arguably criminal. Uh, and that whole system to me uh, is, is sort of deeply offensive to the first, you know, to the First Amendment. Um, I think that now there are probably circumstances in which there are people uh, who are using um, uh, social media platforms to actually plan terrorist attacks. Um, you, you know, I, I don't I don't know the facts of any specific case like that, but I imagine that there must be you know uh, situations in which um, uh, you know bad actors use social media or other communications platforms for precisely that purpose. Um, and uh, I think it is a, you know, a, an important but also difficult question. Like, how do you draw the lines around, um, you know, what's, you know, what a platform should be held responsible for? How do you hold platforms, you know, responsible um, for their role in facilitating that kind of conduct while also protecting, you know, free speech and not allowing the government to dictate the, 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 the limits of political debate. Mm. Uh, any any mm -hmm. other follow-ups? I, I have more questions. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I was I, I was kind of struck by your, uh, you know, on this note of like platforms and the regulations that we're, we're looking to apply to them. Uh, in your, I think it's better, when you were talking about the New York Times article review, uh, you were discussing about these platforms kind of co-opting First, the First Amendment in the ways that would actually chill uh, mm -hmm. this government, governance val governing value. Um, and I kind of want to get your take on Elon Musk <laughs> and his attempts to uh, take on Twitter. Uh, there's a lot of discourse, especially on like our, our periphery Twitter feed, has a lot of people pro Elon Musk doing this as a way to facilitate more free speech. I'm a little mm -hmm. skeptical. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so can you kind of talk about that? this dynamic that's happening where states are, you know, this polarity where states are looking to take away all the free speech rights from yeah. the platform. Yeah. Platforms want to assert every free speech right. Uh, and what, what, what's, what's happening there? Yeah, so, so um, you know, we've been talking, we were talking about transparency solutions and uh, privacy solutions. And those kinds of solutions assume that the First Amendment, you know, we're assuming that the First Amendment wouldn't be an obstacle to those, you know, to that kind of legislation. And that is actually not an entirely, uh, it's not entirely clear that that's, you know, that's a, a, a good assumption. So if you look at these cases in Texas, so Texas and Florida now have passed social media regulation and the laws are different in some respects, but they basically, you know, require, uh, put, put constraints on the social media companies' ability to curate speech on their own platforms, in some circumstances, require them to carry certain kinds of speech. The Florida law requires uh, platforms to carry political candidate speech. In some circumstances, the Texas law prohibits viewpoint discrimination in content moderation. Uh, and those laws also include transparency requirements. So they're pretty far, you know, far ranging laws uh, relating to social media. And uh, the states have argued, so Texas and Florida argue in those cases that um, the social media companies are akin to common carriers, that they're like AT&T. And as a result, the social media companies don't have First Amendment rights to assert. Um, and that gives the states a free hand. You know, the states can regulate them as they, as they want to. And the social media companies, on the other hand, argue that uh, not only do they have First Amendment rights, but they are um, akin to newspapers. That the that Facebook is, you know, the same for First Amendment purposes as the New York Times, and as a result, virtually any regulation of Facebook's activities is unconstitutional. So you have these two visions of the First Amendment, or two understandings of the First Amendment. One. Um, you know, offered by the states, which would give government 
very, very broad power to shape public discourse or distort public discourse because, you know, social media companies don't have First Amendment rights, according to Texas and Florida. And on the other hand, you have uh, a vision in which the social media platforms um, can't be regulated at all, uh, you know, where any regulation of them, including transparency regulation, would be, uh, if not categorically off limits, almost categorically off, off limits. And, um, you know, my, my own view, and this is, you know, what the Knight Institute, what we said in, in our amicus briefs in both of those cases, is that neither of these um, visions of the First Amendment would serve our society well. And, um, you know, we need a First Amendment that is a real um, safeguard against government uh, meddling in the marketplace of ideas. Like we need a First Amendment that prevents Facebook, uh, prevents um, uh, Florida and Texas from you know, dictating what the platforms, uh, dictating the platform's editorial decisions. But we also need a First Amendment that leaves space for legislation and regulation that would serve First Amendment interests or serve free speech interests. Like for example, the kind of uh, transparency legislation that I mentioned earlier, or say due process legislation that requires the platforms to tell people whom they've deplatformed why they deplatformed them. Um, and you know, to me, that seems like um, you know, not just not inconsistent with the First Amendment, but but that it serves free speech values. It makes the, our speech environment work better. And if the First Amendment is a barrier to that kind of legislation, then the First Amendment is not doing the work that we really want the First Amendment to do. Um, so that's the argument that we're making in those cases. It's, it's um, you know, it's kind of, it's a difficult argument because we, we really do feel very strongly that the First Amendment um, you know, the core value of the First Amendment is, uh, it's, it, it is, is in its preventing government actors from dictating or um, molding public discourse, right? That the, the whole point of the First Amendment was to protect self-government, to protect our collective ability to make our own decisions about, uh, you know, what, which ideas are good ones, which voices should be heard, um, what government policy should look like. That has to be a free con a conversation that's free of government interference. And the First Amendment has a crucial role to play in ensuring that governments don't interfere in that conversation. Uh, but we also don't want the First Amendment to be an obstacle to legislation that is necessary to protecting the integrity or vitality of public discourse. Um, and we're trying to, you know, navigate those two, the, the, those two challenges, or sort of navigate a path between those two, those two challenges, and um, uh, you know that's what we've tried to do in that Florida brief, and and more recently in the in, you know in the Texas brief. And so, and, oh yeah, um, just as a follow up to that, so if really the solution consists at least partly of reconceiving the First Amendment, um, this will of course have to go through the judiciary. Ooh even the Supreme Court. How hopeful are you that the judiciary will get this right? And in your experience litigating, how well-versed do you feel like the judiciary is in these issues? Um, so I, I don't, I actually think it's very hard to predict, uh, at least I find it hard to predict how the Supreme Court is gonna handle these cases. I mean, you use the word reconceive the First Amendment. Um, I don't really think of it as, um, you know, we're not asking the courts to reconsider First Amendment principles. We're really asking them to, you know, consider how those fundamental principles apply in this new new context. I don't know, maybe reconceive is the right word, but but that's, you know, that's what we're, uh, you know, that's what we're thinking about. And, um, you know, the, the, the truth is there, you uh, you know, every case is fact dependent and there are all these big precedents that the court has already decided, but the, those precedents involve facts that are different from the ones that we are dealing with now. And the question is, are the facts in these new contexts different in some material way 
from the facts in those whole contexts. And, um, you know, even among First Amendment scholars and advocates, there's a lot of disagreement about like which facts matter and which facts, uh, you know, which factual differences are, are relevant. Uh, but one of those New York Times pieces that you mentioned, you know, we tried to point out some of the distinctions that we see between social media platforms, editorial decisions and newspapers, editorial decisions. Right. Uh, again, I think that, you know, social media companies do exercise editorial decisions. I think that that editorial judgment is and should be protected by the First Amendment. But I also think it's relevant that they exercise editorial judgment different than newspapers do. Relevant not because it means that, therefore, Florida and Texas can do whatever they want, but relevant because it means that certain kinds of legislation that might be unconstitutional if it were imposed on traditional newspapers might not be unconstitutional if it's imposed on social media companies. And transparency um, legislation, I think, is the best example. Like You can imagine a bill that said um, the New York Times and every other newspaper, they have to explain publicly why they are rejecting the op-eds that they're rejecting. I think that would be obviously unconstitutional. It would be a huge burden on editorial judgment. It would require the New York Times to change its editorial practices because right now it doesn't even articulate its reasons to itself, right? There's no record, uh, no formal record in the New York Times of why they rejected this op-ed and often they probably do it on a whim. Uh, it's just, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a human, uh, irreducibly human decision uh, to accept or not accept an op-ed. Whereas uh, a transparency bill that said the social media platforms have to explain why they have taken down content when they have taken down content doesn't require the social media companies to operate differently. They already uh, know why they've taken down that content. They have, they have um, uh, accept, acceptable use policies or community standards that explain uh, what kinds of content they're taking down. And their algorithms, when they identify uh, content to be taken down, identify that content because it fits within one of those, th those buckets. And uh, there is already a record at some, you know, at some level of why they're doing what they're doing and requiring them to disclose that, um, uh, you know, that reason, I think would not impose the same kind of editorial burden on them as the analogous legislation would impose on the Times. Now, you can still you know, recognize that and say, I still think that that uh, bill would be unconstitutional, unconstitutional as to social media companies, but you have to at least recognize that the question is different. And that was the point of that piece that you, know, that, that you referenced earlier that we wrote for the Times. It's, it was uh, just an effort to get people to recognize that editorial judgment can be exercised in different ways and that it might matter to the First Amendment uh, that editorial judgment is exercised in different ways. Kind of pulling on that, uh, though, you know, this, you, you talk about this difference between editorial judgment with newspapers and those with platforms, even though there's like, you know, New York Times sometimes operates in that same social media sphere when it comes yeah. to the content and comment moderation, you know, and what kind of struck me about these, this, this, these differences seems like some implicit right of access for users or, or, or cause, because, you know, 15 years ago, not everyone expected to be able to have their voices amplified by a platform like New York Times. That's totally editorial, who gets a say in what. Mm -hmm. Whereas with these platforms, it's, a to it's kind of totally different. There's no really publisher. It's just users and and platforms, and there's really no midway except for maybe some algorithmic, you know, decision maker. So I'm just like, what's the actual principle here that's making these two things different? You know? Yeah, I mean, I I haven't thought of it as a right of access, uh, but maybe you could conceive of it that that way. I mean, the way I think about it is just that, um, uh, you know, as a general proposition, the government has a legitimate interest in protecting the integrity and vitality of the digital public sphere. And it has to do that consistent with the First Amendment. It has to do that while respecting the First Amendment, in including by, by respecting the First Amendment rights of the platforms themselves. Uh, but that requires us then to think about, well, what are the First Amendment rights of the platforms themselves? And how do those compare to the First Amendment rights of other, you know, other media actors? And um, 
you know, I've just been approaching it from, from that standpoint, just thinking about, well, you know, what kinds of, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the platform's argument that what they are doing has a First Amendment character, you know, that at least content moderation decisions or labeling uh, user speech, uh, you know, uh, uh, labeling a tweet as misinformation, for example, like that those reflect First Amendment decisions that are protected by the Constitution. Um, but what that protection consists of, like, how, you know, how strong is that protection? And is it the same as the protection that, um, you know, a newspaper gets uh, when it publishes an editorial? I, I have been using, you know, in this conversation with you guys, I've been using newspapers and social media companies as kind of uh, almost a shorthand, you know, but, but, you know, as you just mentioned, you know, newspapers sometimes do what social media companies in their comment sections, for example, they look a lot more like social media companies and social media companies, when they label users posts as misinformation, I think look a lot more like newspapers, right? It's kind of an editorial statement attached to a user comment. And so I'm really using these as shorthands. I recognize that, you know, the shorthands go only so far. Um, I'm not really proposing that newspapers get one level of First Amendment protection and social media companies get another level. What I'm proposing is uh, that it matters what activity an entity is engaged in. You know, uh, if the New York Times is publishing an editorial, uh, it may be protected in a particular way. If Twitter is uh, attaching a label to a user's post, it might be protected in exactly the same way. Uh, but if the New York Times is running its comment section, or, tw or Twitter or Facebook are running a more conventional social media platform, um, uh, you know, maybe the First Amendment protection looks a little bit, a little bit different. Um, you know, that's really the basic, the basic proposal. Um, at the, yeah, at the risk of sort of going in a different direction towards the end of this interview, I'll, I'll keep it rather general, but I'm, just really excited to talk to you in light of your work on the Clapper case, uh, which we studied in my national security law class. Um, and I remember sort of as being like a frustrating technicality that um, these plaintiffs didn't have standing. I'm wondering if you could just like very briefly kind of explain what that case was or the significance of that case. And then also just generally like how that has shaped your approach going forward as a litigator, um, whether it be like fourth, fourth amendment, first amendment, just like what that case, I guess, how it, yeah, shaped your strategy going forward. Yeah, I mean, th that was that was a really tough defeat. Um, so, uh, you know, the short description of the case, I mean, you obviously already know it, but, but it was a challenge to um, the, the FISA Amendments Act of 2008, which was a, a law that expanded the uh, authority of the National Security Agency to surveil Americans phone call, international phone calls and emails. And we went into court and argued that this law was unconstitutional. We were representing um, major human rights organizations, including Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. And we argued that this law was unconstitutional. And we said that we have standing to sue because we communicate internationally. And this law gives the government essentially a free hand to um, surveil those communications. And we lost in a five to four decision. Justice Alito wrote the majority opinion saying, essentially, you haven't shown that it's actually likely that the government is engaged in this kind of surveillance at all. And uh, that decision was issued in um, uh, the spring of 2013. And uh, one of the reasons Edward Snowden decided to uh, do what he ended up doing was that decision. He felt like the courts had failed uh, to protect Americans, and he also felt that Congress had uh, uh, failed. And that was the reason he, you know, he ended up uh, sharing information with 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 the newspapers. And then, um, you know, that information sort of confirmed that the surveillance that we thought was almost certainly going on was in fact going on, and, and that we had underestimated the scope of the government's actual surveillance activities. We went back to court um, after that. There was another Clapper case. I don't know if you read that in your uh, in your class or not, but we, uh, we challenged the, yeah, so there's a, it didn't go to the Supreme Court, it went to the Second Circuit though, uh, involving the call records program that the, uh, the Guardian uh, exposed. Uh, 
Uh, this is a program that involved the collection of Americans' domestic uh, metadata of Americans' domestic phone calls. And thanks to the disclosures that um, that, that Snowden, you know, that, that, that thanks to Snowden's disclosures, we were able to establish standing in that case uh, and eventually get the Second Circuit to uh, enjoin that particular surveillance program. But as to the lessons from, from, from all of that, you know, national security cases, um, you know, for, for the most part, the um, American courts refuse to engage with the merits of, um, uh, of national security authority. And for, you know, for 20 years, outside the context of detention, like the Guantanamo cases are the, one, the, the, the exception. And even though even that exception has many asterisks next to it, but um, uh, on Guantanamo, the court, the Supreme Court engaged on other national security issues, including surveillance, but also torture, uh, extrajudicial killing. The courts, um, uh, you know, found a million different ways to throw cases out at the threshold. Uh, the amnesty case was thrown out on standing. Other cases were thrown out on state secrets. Uh, or on the political question doctrine or immunity. Uh, and one case after another, the courts rejected uh, and just refused to engage the merits, which had the effect of leaving to the political branches the decision of um, you know, what American counterterrorism policy should look like. Even when that policy had profound implications for individual rights, the court stayed out. And I, I think that that is um, you know, a, a failure of historic magnitude uh, a hundred years from now, if people are still writing the history of this period, it's that failure, I think, that will stand out more than any specific decision that any specific court made over the last 20 years. It'll be this larger picture, which is the failure of the courts to play the role that the Constitution envisioned them playing um, for those, you know, over those 20 years. Jamil, well, thank you again. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been really really fascinating to talk to you. Yes. And I, um, I guess I want to go back to the beginning where you talked about how in 2002 at the ACLU, you guys were wondering what the implications of the Patriot Act would be. And I'm thinking back then to how so much has happened since 9-11, where we've had, uh, you know, all the three presidential administrations that have arguably engaged in pretty bad human rights abuses. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering um, how you mentioned the kind of inaction of the courts. And yet a lot of the reason why we even know about these abuses was because of legal action, legal activism. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering in two parts, first back then, could you even, could you have even fathomed uh, what has happened since then in the two decades? And also if we are pushing through the law to figure out the truth and to address these abuses, or we're not getting legal solutions or even necessarily solutions from Congress, um, do you anticipate these kinds of abuses of state power to get worse in the future? Uh, is this a trend that you detect or is this more like American politics in the national security stage as usual? Are you sure you want to end on this note? Because uh, it's good to <laughs> we, like, we like to be cynical in an optimistic yeah. way. Well, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be cynical. I, I, I think that, um, so, you know, I, um, I was, I was 30 years old on, on 9-11. You know, so, so, most of my life was pre 9-11 and, uh, you know, I, I still, you know, recognize the huge difference between the world we're living in now and the world we were living in, you know, then it really was inconceivable, uh, you know, when I was 25, that, uh, the United States would have, uh, you know, would authorize torture against prisoners or would establish black sites overseas or, um, uh, you know, have a bureaucratized extrajudicial killing program. I mean, this kind of stuff was not, uh, you know, to say that it's just not consistent with, you know, the understanding we had of, of the country is, is, is just to understate the, you know, the, the, the shift. It, it really was like being... Um, uh, you know, ejected from one universe and put into another universe. And, you know, you all are, are younger than I am. I don't know, you know, uh, uh, how how much you remember, whether you remember. Most of our lives are after 9-11. After 11, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
you know, and that, 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 you know, that's a sad, it's a, it's just sad that, that this memory of that, you know, that society is disappearing because it, there, it, it was better, you know, it, it, it was, um, uh, you know, it was, it, it, it felt like we were making progress towards, um, uh, you know, the, the human rights were becoming um, not, not just more widely understood, but more widely um, uh, honored. And, you know, then we took this, you know, the sharp, the sharp turn. And uh, I really do think that the courts failed us in this significant way uh, after, you know, after 9-11. And now we have this uh, legal uh, infrastructure for executive impunity. You know, we have this body of law that essentially allows the executive branch, or at least the political branches, to decide what national security policy looks like, um, and that marginalizes or entirely, um, uh, you know, makes irrelevant the question of individual rights. The individual rights are just not part of that conversation because it's not the executive branch's job to think about individual rights. Uh, it's the court's job, and the courts have already said now that they, um, or have said over and over again, that they're just not interested in doing that when it comes to policies introduced in the name of national security. So I think that's a terrible thing. It puts us in a really vulnerable place. Um, uh, you know, one, we are kind of at the mercy of the political branches in a way that I don't think we should be. I don't think we were 20 years ago, uh, but, um, you know, we're at the mercy of the political branches. And uh, especially now when sort of authoritarian impulses seem to be so widely um, you know, appealing to so many people, uh, you know, so many Americans. Um, and there are so many political leaders who seem ready to, you know, enthusiastic about exploiting that, um, it, that see that as an opportunity to be exploited. You know, I think that that's a, a really dangerous, you know, a really dangerous uh combination and I, I don't want to end on a, a, a kind of you know, depressing note but I, I I do think that we're at a, a really dangerous point in our you know in our in, in our history and we uh, you know the issues we've been talking about about free speech and, and and self-government are kind of at the you know at the center of that like there's this question of how we make the digital public sphere work for us as a democracy seems to me kind of central to um to this larger set of questions. Mm -hmm. um, Jamil, I'm sure we'll edit that part more in the middle than at the end. Uh, <laughs> right, all right, good. That sounds, that sounds like a good yeah, idea. I, I feel like that's just such an important way to, I mean, totally. we, this is, thank you so much yeah, for this interview. This has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, sure, thanks for inviting me.